If you will stand as you are able and for the reading of the gospel. This is the gospel of John in the 11th chapter. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, but rather it's for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And when she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that it you, if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And now with the confidence that Christ gives us in our faith, let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> You may be seated. <clears throat> so many of you are familiar with the story of Lazarus. And in other Gospels, there are accounts of Jesus raising people from the dead. There was the daughter of Jairus, who was the official in the synagogue in Jerusalem. And his daughter had died of a fever, 
and Jesus raised her. And then there was the widow's son, who Jesus raised this youth while he was in the funeral procession going to his grave. But it's interesting because the Gospel of John is the only one that includes the account of Lazarus. And really, it's, a, it's in this narrative, it's a pivotal point in Jesus' ministry because before this, Jesus' Jesus's enemies had generally just been opposed to him. But after he raises Lazarus from the dead, there will be an intent plot to have him killed. So in a real sense, this is sort of the beginning of the end of Jesus' teachings and signs. Additionally, Lazarus will also have a plot to kill him after his resurrection. So in this gospel, John describes the love that Jesus had for Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, there's a lot of Marys in the Bible, but you might remember this Mary is the one that anointed Jesus with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. In a later chapter, it says that in doing this, unknowingly, she prepared him for his burial. Now, Martha is the other sister, and we probably all have a Martha in our life. She's the bossy one. She's the take charge. I know how I want it done and when I want it done and the way I want it done. And you find yourself just doing it because that's what Martha's do. But Jesus loved both of these sisters, and he loved Lazarus. So when, Jesus, when Lazarus became ill, the two sisters sent word to Jesus and said, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. Essentially, they were asking him to come and to intervene. But this would mean returning to the, to the region of Judea, which would have been very dangerous. Now, Bethany was in Judea, but surely before Lazarus had become ill, the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders had become increasingly threatened by Jesus and the signs and the miracles and even maybe, maybe more that, that many people were beginning to believe that he was the promised Messiah. So they met him in the temple and they challenged him as he was teaching. And he said to them, the Father and I are one. Well, that didn't end well. In fact, in chapter 8, it says, Therefore they picked up stones to kill him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So Jesus left Judea under the threat of being stoned. Then we come to the words that make us pause. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When therefore Jesus heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Well, I didn't see that coming. What was the point of Jesus waiting two more days? But you see, Jesus had a plan that Mary and Martha and Lazarus could have never imagined. And Jesus was always clear about what his mission was. He had one goal, and that was to reveal the Father and to glorify God. This final miracle would surpass all of the other miracles that Jesus did because this miracle, and he understood this, had to be definitive because there were still some that questioned whether he was truly the Messiah. But you know, it's hard when we put ourselves in that situation. I get giving God the glory, but is this the response of a loving friend? Does it seem maybe a little bit cruel that Jesus let Lazarus suffer for two more days to his death? Or maybe it seems a little bit cold that he let Mary and Martha down. But like Lazarus' sisters, we automatically assume that because we know that Jesus loves us, we know that he has the power to heal, that he'll do it in the ways that we seem that seem the most, the, the most practical, the, most, the way that we assume it should be. It, it will be. It, it just must be this way. But we also see Jesus' perfect expression of his love. And, and then when we look back, we see God's plan and his hand all in it. Now, John describes Jesus' love for Lazarus' family. 
And it really becomes the anchor of this story because it wasn't for lack of love that Jesus was delayed. And it wasn't a lack of love that caused Lazarus' death because glorifying God never cancels God's love. Delayed answers, as hard as they are, are many times for a purpose that we can't initially understand. But when we look at the situations through an eternal perspective, we begin to see what Jesus has promised, that inexplicable peace, that joy that passes all of our understanding. We see through a complete lens that God's timing was perfect and his plan has always been for our future and for our good. So after two days passed, Lazarus went with his disciples to Bethany and they found that Lazarus had died and they had placed him in a tomb and he had been there for four days. Now Jews believed that after three days, the soul left the body. And that's an important detail because it, it showed without question for those that might have, have thought that this was a contrived um, situation with Lazarus, but it proved that he had been dead. Mary and Martha both met Jesus and they said the same words. By this time, it was the fourth day and the finality of death had set in. And they said, Lord, if only you had come, my brother would not have died. Can you just hear the grief and the regret in those words? How often have I said those words? How often have we said those words? Lord, if only. You know, Lord, if only you had come when I ask. Lord, life is hard. And I needed you. And I felt like you left me. Lord, it's too late now. The grief is here to stay. The door is shut. And the tomb is sealed. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever prayed so hard that someone that you love's life would be spared? That they would be healed of some vicious disease, cured of an addiction, restored a relationship, or even a dream? But there was no sign, and it seemed God was silent. You needed a miracle. You know, most of my life, the word miracle produced some anxiety in me. Now, I knew people and situations that I was absolutely positive there was nothing but a miracle that was going to change that. But I always prayed one sentence short of asking God for one. Now, I believed in miracles. I had heard of, of miracles happening on occasion, but it just didn't seem like they happened in my zip code. And when I thought about it, I think I considered it just too big of an ask of God. That maybe it was like treating God like a superhero that just swooped in and fixed things and then left again so as not to meddle or interfere with my life. You know, that changed in the death of my mentor, Jim Webb. Jim had been my boss at Procter & Gamble for several years. And when I retired after the birth of my second son, our relationship changed to mirror one of more of a mentor. Uh, in fact, I would say that Jim discipled me. God placed him in my life to prepare me for exactly where I stand right now. Jim was the most wise, gifted, and spiritually mature man I had ever met in my life. And he invested in me and my family for 30 years. Then there was the day that Jim was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And when the, the, the treatments were not, were not uh, he wasn't responding to the treatments, some friends of his planned a service of healing and life. So I drove to Atlanta, <clears throat> and he had asked me, he said, Do you, would you like to speak? And I said, absolutely. 
I wanted to give words to all the extraordinary ways that Jim had changed my life. But it was that healing part that began to make me anxious. And in my anxiousness, these questions began to arise. What if all of us, and there had to have been 500 in that gathering place, what if we all prayed for Jim's healing and it just wasn't God's plan? Maybe it just wasn't God's timing. Would these people lose faith in God? Would it make God seem less God-like? Would they be so disappointed in the God of Jim Webb that they would just abandon their faith? And then that lie that always surfaced to the top. Maybe it was just too big of an ask. Well, that service changed me. The second speaker that came up said, you know, we have all come to pray for a miracle for Jim. But I stand here to tell you that that miracle has already happened. Well, the silence in that room was palatable. And then he went, the friend went on to say, you see, early in Jim's life, God sought him. He put people and experiences in his life to bring and woo John, Jim, to him. He asked Jim, he gave Jim an invitation that have had eternal value because he asked Jim to accept the forgiveness, the redeeming grace that Christ did on the cross, to accept him as his Lord and his Savior and to serve him. And the miracle was that Jim accepted that invitation and he dedicated his life to serving him that day until his last breath. You know, the friend went on to say, I don't know if God will heal Jim of his cancer on this side of heaven. I sure would love that. But here's what I know, and here's what Jim knows, is that God has healed his spirit, and he has sealed his future. And that is a miracle of eternal proportions. You know, sometimes God trusts us in our weakness, and he even allows us to join him in his suffering to tell the story of his unfailing love. You know, I left that service of healing and life with a burden lifted and a heart set free. You see, I had appointed myself as marketing director, as spokesperson to spin God's plans and his purposes and his outcomes. But come to find out the God of the universe, he didn't need one. So isn't that what we see in Mary and Martha's grief? Both sisters walked through the valley of the shadow of death but they were never meant to stay there, just like we are never meant to stay there. And Jesus never left them. He walked with them, just like Jesus walks with us. The scripture says that Jesus wept, and I believe Jesus weeps when we have losses in our life. And I believe it breaks his heart when he sees the brokenness like we saw just last night, the absolute divisiveness, the sadness in this world, and he weeps with us. But that's why he gave up his divinity, and that's why he walked with us, became one of us, died on the cross for us, to ask and tell us the same thing that he told Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. You know, he asked Martha, he said, Martha, do you believe that? And I think Jesus asks us the same question. When we think about the raising of Lazarus, many times I think that we dwell on the I am the resurrection, and we don't remember the last part that says, and I am the life. 
Maybe the temptation is us for, for us to think that it's just a redundant sentence. I am the resurrection and the life. They must simply mean the same things. But I think Jesus made that distinction because we aren't raised to a life just in a future existence. We are raised to a new life right here and right now with Jesus. You know, at the end of the scripture, we see the crowd following Mary and Martha to Lazarus' tomb. And the tomb was a cave that had a, a really large stone to cover it. Some speculate that it took like 20 people to move the stone. And then scripture tells us in the rest of the story that Jesus says, remove the stone. And then here's where we can count on Martha, ever the practical one. Martha says, Lord, there will be a stench because he has been dead four days. Thank you, Martha. Can't you just see Jesus chuckle? But he told her, he said, Martha, you will see the glory of God, just as I told you. So the stone was removed, and it said that Jesus raised his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you hear me always. But because of the people standing around me, I say this, that they may see and believe that you did send me. And with that, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Come out of that tomb. And Lazarus, who was bound from head to foot with burial cloths, and Jesus said to them, to the crowd, he said, unbind him and let him go free. You know, inside of us may be a tomb where we have buried sin. And what's in there isn't pretty, and it doesn't smell good. And even when we want new life, how many times do we just hesitate and we just linger by the stone? And you know, we all have those stones. And there's areas of our life where we all need a miracle. Who's going to pay this bill? This marriage, it's over. This cancer, it will kill me. I guess it's just not in the cards for me to find my soulmate, to conceive children. That dream, it's not going to happen. But then we see Jesus. And when we look through his eternal perspective, we see that there is, there is no stone that is too large. There is no tomb too cold. And there is no hell too dark that Jesus can't move it, warm it, or light it. You know, every day we smell death. But we have to understand that something has to die to be raised to new life. We can't experience resurrection without death. And I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about a death to ourselves, to our sinful nature. And every day, by the grace of God, he gives us the opportunity to be changed and to change, to unbind and to be unbound, to let go and to be let go. You know, the unbinding of Lazarus was a death sentence for death because no longer was there a sting, because resurrection meant that love is stronger than death than hate, that life is stronger than death, that even when we don't think it, that good does overcome evil, and that, that in Christ all of our needs are met and all of the stones are moved. You know, many of you know that my husband Charles died seven years ago in an accident on July 9th. And when his heart stopped, a big part of mine stopped also. You know, I cried out in the same words as Martha and Mary, if only. And I filled that blank in with a thousand different things. For a year, I didn't look up. 
and I didn't see any glory that God could be brought into this situation. But instead, I looked around and I saw an empty chair. And I looked back and all I saw was what I should have done, what I could have done. And then I looked down at my future that lay in ashes. And then in God's mercy and his compassion, the same mercy and the same compassion that he gives us every single day, God lifted my eyes up to him. You know, in, in the Bible, the number seven symbolizes wholeness and completeness. This week, my family marked two birthdays on July 9th, just seven days apart. Because this week, my daughter gave birth to Elizabeth Brooks Payne. And her birthday, we also celebrated our seventh grandchild, but we celebrated also the heavenly birthday of her grandfather, my husband Charles, just seven years apart. Now, do you think that's a coincidence? Well, the Bible says that it isn't because scripture says out of the ashes comes new life. So what do you need to let die today so that you can come out of that tomb? What binds you to death and keeps you from the abundant life that Jesus has for you? Because whatever has wrapped you and keeps you in that dark cave, whatever stinks in your life, Jesus says, he looses it. And Jesus calls out to you just like he calls out to Lazarus. And he says, child of mine, come out of that cave. Be unbound and be set free. Now that's a miracle. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision. If you would like to make this church your home and this family your church family, will you join me at the chancel when we sing verse 3?